Praise be to God indeed. Amen. And welcome to Palm Sunday. You know, I will say, every time there's these Sundays that kind of come back every year, Palm Sunday, Pentecost, things like that, there's always this question of, what do you say about this story um, that we talk about every year? Um, and and I, I, I think I said that, I don't know if I said it to Carrie Ann or somebody this more, uh, earlier this week, and I'm like, oh man, what do you say about Palm Sunday that hasn't been said a million times? But then I realized, whatever I said, I said a year ago, and you don't remember. So... <laughs> So chances are, I could just say the same thing. Now, the problem is, I don't know what I said last year either. So we're just going to go with it. No, um, but they're actually, thankfully, th this is one of those Sundays. It's just so rich in imagery and so rich in meaning and importance um, that, that you, it, there's almost too much to say. That's, I promise I, I won't. I'll try not to. Um, but uh, there's this really interesting moment, um, and, it, and there's a reason that we put this in the calendar, and it's the reason we keep coming back to it years after year after year, um, because, because it is so rich and it is so important, and it's this really important moment where Jesus is finally entering Jerusalem, um, finally entering the temple area, um, and of course he's doing it um, at the beginning of kind of what we would then become, you know, it would then become Holy Week, right? He's basically doing it in the last week of his um, life on earth, um, at least before for the crucifixion, right? He knows this is coming. He's told his disciples it's coming, but as we know, the disciples don't always hear what they're supposed to hear. Um, uh, but they know something is going to happen. They know they've been wandering with Jesus for three years at this point, um, that they've kind of stirred up trouble in different places that they went, that people are starting to be uh, wonder. Um, Jesus' fame and his notoriety is growing. Um, and, and so it doesn't take much to figure out something's going to come to a head right? Um, and, and this time of Passover, it makes sense that this is when this would happen, because the Passover is one of the festivals, but it's also really um, the festival of festivals, and it's the time uh, when if you were a good, um, you know, if you were a good Jew of the time, you would come um, to Jerusalem um, during one of the festivals, and the one that you would always try to make it for if you can is Passover, because of course Passover celebrates um, the Passover and the Exodus and, the, and people and them being saved from slavery in Egypt. This is a big deal to them, um, right? It celebrates Moses, who's a really big deal, obviously. Uh, so, it makes sense that Passover is already rich with imagery. It's rich with stuff going on. Um, and um, because it is the celebration um, of uh, the, the beginning of the process of the Jews being freed from an oppressive force, you can imagine um, that many people are interested in what happens on this day, um, including the group of people who are currently oppressing the Jews, uh, which, of course, is the Romans, because the Romans are in charge. Right? So the Romans are in charge, and they say what happens, and they say what you can and can't do, and they give um, a little bit of leeway um, uh, to the Jews of the day, uh, but they still want to make sure that, you, that they know that who's in charge. So at the beginning of this whole week of festivities that lead up to Passover, um, there are a couple of things that happen, and one of the things that happens is parades, because humans just love parades. We've always loved parades, right? I mean, I think that's one of the things I mourned losing last summer because of COVID uh, more than anything. Where the, you know, it was one of the things that, like, oh, we don't get to be on a fire truck in the parade this year. Like, that was a lot of fun. Um, so he was have done this forever, um, and and so and, and and so Jesus basically, this is we have in Palm Sunday is Jesus's parade, but Jesus is not the only parade. Right? So the Romans um, and the Roman governors are going to be around when Passover is celebrated because they want to make sure that nobody gets any uppity ideas. Um, so they actually, but they want, they're not just going to show up one day like quietly, right? They're going to make sure that people know that they're in charge. Uh, so when the Romans come, which is kind of the picture on the, my right, I don't know, sure, um, uh, in, in there is they're going to show up the way that you expect Romans to show up. And if you've seen any of like the old, like, you know, 1950s, you know, big Roman drama epic things where they've got soldiers marching and they're holding those banners and people riding in on horses and chariots and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's pretty much what they're going to do. And they're going to run into the city and make sure uh, and, and, and to show like, hey, we're here uh, and we're here in force. Right. And if you were important, if you were a person of power, if you were, say, a religious leader of the day, then where you would be when those parades were happening um, is, of course, at this one. 
Because you want the Roman governors to see you there. They, you want the Roman governors to know that you're supporting them. You want the Roman governors um, to do that. So if you're an important religious leader or any sort of leader of the day, though all the leaders were religious leaders, then you're going to be at that parade. Now Jesus has his followers go and get a donkey. Bring it back. And they sort of source, kind of stage an alternate parade. Um, that looks a little bit different. So Jesus rides in, not on a horse and not on a chariot, um, not on something fancy. He rides in on a donkey. And they don't, <clears throat> and as he rides in, um, the people who were there and want to celebrate him, they do this thing where they lay down palm branches in, in front of him. And, and we probably don't quite understand this today because I don't know if you know this, we have to like import these palm branches. Like the, this, this FYI, palm trees don't grow around here. Uh, at least I'm not aware of. Does anybody have any palm trees in their yard? Are there palm trees I don't know about? Okay. I know in Montana, there's Montana. Very, there are no palm trees in Montana, right? You have to like import things. Like we got to go through time and energy and care to bring the palm branches so you have them to wave. So I hope you all enjoy that. Um, but they weren't doing that. They were basically looking around and going, what do I have? And I'm like, oh, um, I'll just grab this because this is what's on the tree next to me. And I want to do something in honor of Jesus. So I'm just going to grab that and lay that down because the roads aren't paved and they're dirty and they're dusty. So obviously that is a sign of honor. So I'm gonna take what I have, whatever is near me. I'm not one of the important religious people because if I was, I'd be at the other parade. And I'm gonna lay it down in front of this person who's coming, this new person that I've heard about, this person who's not riding in on a chariot but is riding in on a donkey. He's doing something very humble. I think sometimes we may think that, you know, this is something akin to like throwing roses at his feet. Uh, that's a Gen X movie reference for you right there. Um, but that's not really what's going on. They're taking what they have and they're putting it at the feet of this person that they're hoping is going to do something. They're not sure what, but they, sang, they sing Hosanna, which does mean literally... God save us. Now, this is one of those things where um, the, the modern contemporary today might be, you know, rolling up to the party in your pickup truck instead of your Rolls Royce, right? Both those make a statement, but they make a different statement, right? Jesus is rolling up to the party in his pickup truck. He's going to ruin their black tie affair. Oh, come on. All right, fine. That's a Gen X movie ref music reference for you right there. All right. Um, now, and what he's doing here, and what Jesus is doing here is actually remarkable because Jesus is actually showing he has a better understanding um, of actually Jewishness. He has a better understanding of the expectations of Scripture. He has a better understanding of what God wants than the religious leaders of the day does. And we know this from a couple different places. Um, one of his, we know the story from the story of Solomon. So where is Jesus going? He's going to the temple. This is the second temple. Who built the first temple? Solomon. All right, come on, you're, you're awake out there. Good, good. You didn't know there'd be a Bible trivia today, but there is. Um, so Solomon built the first temple. When Solomon is David's son, and when, da when so David wanted to um, announce and proclaim that Solomon was going to be um, named the new king of Israel, uh, one of the things that he did is he actually took Solomon and he put him on a donkey. And he sent the Solomon on the donkey down to the religious leaders of the day um, and said, you need to anoint him the new king. And this is how he is going to arrive to you, not in fanfare, not in the Rolls Royce. He's going to arrive to you on the donkey. Now you go forward a little bit in time, you get the prophecies of, uh, you get the prophecies of Zechariah and the prophecies of Zechariah. One of the things it talks about is what this future king will be like. And of course the future king, when it says very specifically in Zechariah, is that future great king that we're all waiting for will ride in Jerusalem, ride into the temple, and he'll do it humbly, and he'll do it specifically on a donkey. And then first and second Maccabees, which are both current, you might be saying right now, that's not in the Bible. And I'm like, it's not, but it is. It's kind of one of those weird in-between books. Um, you'll find it in some, but not others. Uh, but one of the things it talks about is when uh, the Jews get managed to retake the temple from the oppressors of the day, 
and they do it by laying, waving their palm branches in excitement. So this idea of the palm branches, the idea of the donkey is deep, deep, deep in the imaginations of the people of the day. The imaginations that Jesus understands, the imagination, um, the expectation that he knows, and that everybody else, all of the important people, are ignoring. So Jesus accepts this right? He lets them do this. Jesus doesn't often do this, right? I mean, usually when Jesus, when people try to do nice things to Jesus, when basically people try to put Jesus up on a pedal, he usually resists it, but this time he lets them do it. Um, in fact, he encourages them to do it. So he enters the temple, right? He, in, he enters the area, and he enters in this great way. Um, he enters with the palm branches and the celebration and the shouting, and everybody's exciting, and what's going to happen now? And then he doesn't just ride back out, he doesn't go to the finest dinner, the finest table at the finest restaurant in town, even though it's not really a thing back then. He goes, he goes into the temple, and then he gets off his donkey, goes in, and drives out the money changers right away. He basically says, hey, there's this thing that's happening here. If you keep reading, you'll understand why he does this. He says, this thing that's happening here is basically taking advantage of people. You're taking advantage of people. You're locking up God behind a, you know, behind a box you have to pay for, right? He's like, You're, you, th- this can't not, no longer be. This is not how God wants it to be anymore. Now, Jesus at this time and his disciples at this time probably could have paid the money changers. They had the money to do it, but Jesus knew not everybody did. And those barriers needed to be broken down. And so he waited until everybody was watching. He waited um, until after all of this had happened. And then he says, okay, if you're going to listen to me, if you're going to put me in a position of authority, if you're going to um, allow me, uh, if you're going to pay attention to what I'm doing, then look at what I'm doing. I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something not for my benefit. I'm going to do something for your benefit. I'm going to take the authority you give me and use it in this way so that things can be better for all of us. That is what Jesus does on Palm Sunday. It is about palm branches, it is about that, but it isn't just about that. Now, um, those of you who have been part of uh, the Tuesday night study that we just finished um, on our book, uh, Leaders Eat Last, um, you uh, met a person in that book, um, and the person, one of the people we met in that book is named Bob Chapman. Um, and Bob Chapman um, is um, a CEO. He's the CEO of a $3 billion company that is 12,000 employees. Um, and they are a global manufacturer. And if you know, manufacturing is as we know today, um, a very competitive business and manufacturers, especially manufacturers in the United States, face a lot of trials and hardships. Um, But Bomb Relief is an incredibly successful, um, actually multinational manufacturing company um, named Barry Wellmuller, Barry Wellmuller, Wellmuller, no, Wellmuller, something like that. Uh, (laughs) um, And it's a company, it's one of those large companies you've probably never heard of because it's a company that builds products to service other companies, right? So you have no doubt encountered packaging and other sorts of things in your life that were manufactured on machines that were manufactured by Barry Waymiller, um, even though you've probably never heard of him. and so Bob Chapman was sort of an up-and-comer um, in, uh, in his company. He was, a very, he was an executive at a young age um, and really helped lead them um, on a tremendous bit, amount of growth in uh, the 90s and in through the 2000s. Um, he's been celebrated as a CEO um, in many places, um, always on the list. If you say 100 best CEOs, Bob will be on there. Um, Bob has this interesting philosophy Um, when it comes to his employees and his customers um, that is somewhat radical, um, at least in the world that he lives in. And his radical philosophy is that his customers and his employees should actually be treated as human beings. Crazy. Crazy idea. Um, and uh, he's, he's gone on, um, he basically comes on and says, uh, he, and he has this whole sense, he actually wrote a book um, called Everybody Matters, The Extraordinary Power of Caring for Your People Like Family. Right? And this is a business book for business people. Um, right? And he argues that in his 12,000 person, multi billion dollar company, we should be treating every employee um, like family. And obviously, he himself can't do that. And he talks about the strategies and the way you go about that. Um, 
And many times over uh, the course of their company, he had the opportunity to put this philosophy to the test. Um, one of the big ones was, of course, for, for many companies, was 2008 and the financial crisis. And one of the things that happened is a lot of manufacturing slowed down. A lot of their business um, went away kind of overnight. And they were faced with um, a challenge. They were faced with, like, what do we do? Um, what most companies would do in that situation, what a lot of companies did in that situation, is, of course, if you don't have as much income coming in, then you have to have less expenses going out. Um, and oftentimes, some of your most expensive things are your employees. So we all know that 2008, 2009, there were a lot of layoffs that happened. Bob decided to take another path with this company. Um, and rather famously, it's written out a lot, um, is instead he introduced um, basically a furlough program and said, everybody, uh, we're, instead of a few of us having to basically sacrifice everything by sacrificing our jobs, we're all going to sacrifice a little. And so everybody has to take four weeks, so over the course of year, everybody has to take four weeks unpaid, was the deal, you can take it however you want, you don't have to take it in a row. And what they discovered when they released this program was over time, what ended up happening was people who were actually able to afford to take even a little bit more time off started trading with other employees. So if you could afford to take five weeks off, you would, so somebody else only had to take three. And when they did surveys, they did surveys before everything happened, and they did surveys serving the thing after, as they went through this year and as they dealt with this kind of furlough program and this idea of shared sacrifice for one another, something interesting happening, morale in the company actually went up. Actually went up. Now, Barry gets written about. He was written about in the book that we read. Um, he's written about in the book that he read, he read himself. One of the things that the book that we read, because it was a business book for business people, um, doesn't really talk about, and the something that his book only talks about a little bit, even though, because it's a business book for business people, um, is that Bob is also um, a deeply committed Christian, a deeply committed person of faith. Now, he's an Episcopalian. He's not a Methodist, but we'll forgive. There's grace. Um, but um, when he's in those circles, when he's in those contexts, when you hear him speak in a context like this or a context with other people of faith, he will talk um, uh, about the idea that his way of leadership and the way that he does what he does isn't just rooted because he thinks it's the best good business practice, though he very much believes it is the best business practice um, that you can have. Um, but he also says, really, the example that he is trying to follow is the example of Jesus. What he thinks is a person of power and a person of authority about what I should be concerned about. He says, I want to be concerned about the same things that Jesus is concerned about. If they're going to put me in a position of authority, I'm going to use my authority to do the things that Jesus did, which is not take care of myself, but take care of others. Take care of everybody as one of God's beloved children. And he takes that conviction. He doesn't just take it um, on Sunday morning where, you know, he doesn't just take it um, into the Bible studies, but he takes it out into the world. And he has this great quote. This is, uh, he says, business could be the most powerful force for good in the world if leaders would embrace the awesome responsibility of leadership, caring for people and giving them meaning, purpose, and fulfillment through their work is not in disharmony with creating value. You're called to be an act like Jesus. Sure, when you're here, I like it when you do that but not just when we're here. We have the opportunity to be like Jesus anytime in those places where we can be of influence. Now, I am not aware that any of you are CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies. Just gonna go on a limb. I think I'd know that. Maybe I wouldn't. I don't know. I'm not sure. We have people streaming we've never met. So if you are, give me a ring. I'd love to know that. But we all have those times. We all are sometimes put in those positions where we can have an effect on other people. And as I was going through this and you know, thinking about all these big, important people and the big, important things they do, um, a story in my own life just kept coming back over and over and over again about the time when I really, really first learned this lesson. Now, I'm going to show you the story. I, I've been on the fence about whether I was going to show you the picture that goes with the story, but I love you and I trust you because this story happens when I'm my freshman year of high school. Yes, that's me in the middle. It was the 90s. We'll leave it at that. Um, and this is me, uh, my freshman and sophomore year of high school, as, part, as, as, as has been well covered in here. I was not the most athletic person, so I was not on sports teams uh, in high school. But this is me um, as, in my freshman and sophomore years as part of the future homemakers of America, because they're the ones that got to cook. I like that. 
Um, they're obviously not called that anymore. They're, uh, actually, while I was part of that organization, there was a movement to undertake a name change, and so subsequently they have changed their name, and you will find that organization today, but now it's Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America, which I like, Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America. Good organization, we have one at the high school, wonderful people. Um, Back when I was doing it, I was in, it was still called FHA. We got to hang out. Um, we got to hang out in what we would now call the culinary arts space, which we used to call the home ec room, right? Because again, that's where you got to cook the food. Which, as far as I was concerned, there was no better place to be um, as far as that was. Well, one of the things that we did as part of this group um, was we did a fundraiser. And our standard fundraiser um, was to um, sell concessions um, at the basketball games, at the boys' basketball games, which was good business um, in Mile City, uh, Montana. Our boys' basketball games were very well attended, though I myself did not play. I attended almost all of them uh, because when I joined the organization, the person that was in charge of the concession stand um, was, had... had um, graduated and they were looking for somebody else to do it. And I thought, oh, this sounds like fun. I want to do this. Um, and so I did. Um, and I learned how we ordered food and I learned how to, you know, get the stuff we needed. And, and basically there were two concession stands. The FFA ran one where they sold Pepsi and candy bars. You don't care about all this, but I'm telling you anyway. Um, so the FFA ran one where they sold candy bars and Pepsi, and they were allowed to sell that. And we could sell Coke products and basically everything else. So we sold the stuff you had to cook. We sold hot dogs. We sold popcorn. We sold all that stuff. And I learned very quickly, you always make a fresh bat of popcorn right before halftime. And then you set up a fan, and you blow it into the thing. I also noticed you could, I also found out very quickly that you could actually order slightly smaller Polish dogs, and nobody would notice, and they'd pay the same amount of money. So you can be shrewd and be a Christian. I'm just saying. All right. Um, so uh, so I, I enjoyed this. I really did enjoy this. I really took to it. It's something a lot of fun for me to do. Uh, and I remember um, we were one of the early one of the early Saturdays when we were opening up. First or second Saturday, I was there. Um, the I had come early and I got everything all set up and ready to go. Um, and uh, uh, the, the everyone else who signed up to work for that first shift came in. And they're like, oh, you got everything ready to go. I'm like, yes, welcome to Jeremy Land. And a couple of them laughed, and one of them didn't. And after about an hour, we're sitting there working, we got some people going, and, um, and, uh, and, and I found that this one, the one person who didn't um, wasn't there. She was somewhere else. And so I'm like, well, where's, where's this person? She's like, I don't know. She wandered off. I'm like, okay. Well, we're, it's about to be halftime. We need the help. So I, I go and find her, and she's upset. And, and, uh, and, I, and, and finally, in the course of the conversation, I'm like, what's, what's going on? She's like, well, I thought I was coming to work for something for this group. I didn't know I was coming to work for you. That kind of hurts. And it did. I had to apologize because I said, you know, you're right. This isn't about me. This is our thing. We're all here to do this together. And she was upset and she had the right to be. Because in that moment, it wasn't about what it was supposed to be about. It wasn't about this thing we were doing together to raise money for all this important stuff we were doing. It was about me. And me trying to get credit for what I had done not worrying so much about everybody else. It's a small thing. It was a small encounter. But I have to tell you, I don't remember a lot from my freshman year of high school. <laughs> I think I've blocked most of it out. But I remember that day. And I remember that experience, and I remember the lesson that I didn't quite learn then, um, but would become the first time of many times that I would need to learn that lesson. That at the end of the day, we are people who are blessed to be given even the smallest amount of authority, the ability to influence people even in the smallest amount of ways. Let's be careful about how we choose to use it. Are we using it in a way that just makes us look good? It's about what we want. Or are we using it in a way that benefits everybody? And the truth is, we all have these opportunities in life. We're all given those chances. Sometimes it's a little more obvious, right? If you're a medical provider, if you're a school teacher, if you're any of these jobs, you know that you have people that are sitting there looking to you for guidance. And it's somewhat easy to see. But sometimes we don't always understand where we are influencing others. We 
where we have the opportunity to put other people's needs ahead of our own. And where we get that chance to do maybe in a small way what we see Jesus do in a big way. Where he takes. He takes the authority. He's take, he takes the influence. He takes what he's being offered. And then he uses it. He doesn't just put it up on a shelf. He doesn't just say thank you and move on. He says, I'm going to use the gift you have given me. And I'm going to use it in a way that is going to benefit us all. Everything that will happen in the week to come, everything that happens between Palm Sunday and Good Friday to Easter, is going to be about that. We're going to see it over and over and over and over again. We're going to see the one without sin take on all the sin. We're going to take the one without blame take all the blame. We're going to see the one that was innocent among all take on the punishment for all. That's what the season is about. And it starts here. It starts on Palm Sunday. And we are all continually, now, 2,000 years later, blessed by what had happened, blessed by what is done. And the request of us is simple, as it always is when it comes to Christ. See what Jesus did. See how Jesus lived. See what Jesus cared about. Go and do the same. So where do we need to get off our donkey? Where do we need to get out of our truck? set aside our needs or wants or desires for the moment so that we can take what we have been given and use it so that we all have a little more of the life God calls us to, a little more of the freedom God asks us for, offers to us, a little bit more of the blessing that is there for all of us. And of course, we all have to remember, and again, this week above all weeks we do, that when we do that work, When we undertake that challenge, we do not do it alone. Because God gave us what we need, and God continues to. God continues to offer us what we need. And one of the ways that we get the strength and the courage we need to do what is right is we come to the table. We come to the table that Christ set this week so many years ago, and the table we keep coming back to, that we can partake in the strength, and we continue to have what God wants for us. So, I'm going to invite you um, to prepare your hearts and minds uh, for communion this, this, this morning. If you're at home and you have elements, that's great. 